Okay, let's get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, AWS controllers for Kubernetes. <clears throat> I'm Jerry Fallon and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today, Jay Pipes, Principal Open Source Engineer at Amazon Web Services. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jay for today's presentation. Thank you, Jerry. I really appreciate the opportunity. So yeah, today we're gonna talk a little bit about this ACK project, which is a, a brand new set of open source service controllers for Kubernetes that allows a bridging of the AWS universe of managed services with Kubernetes. So we're gonna get started here with what should be a pretty familiar story for lots of folks. Um, and it's a story that sort of highlights what the benefits of ACK are and where it fits into things. So we've got Alice. She is a web developer and she's a huge Kubernetes fan, of course. Uh, she's developed this Node.js application for her internal department at her company. And she's, you know, she's using modern development practices and uh, building her application into an immutable Docker image. And um, she's using, she, or at least initially, she, she chose to use SQLite as sort of a simple storage database for her uh, application. And that was all fine and dandy. So Alice being a huge Kubernetes fan, she goes and deploys her application into a Kubernetes cluster. And she does this usually using the normal uh, kubectl apply for a deployment and a service for some sort of top level networking stuff. And maybe she also does some um, uh, ingress load balancer um, uh, resources for her application. And that's all fine and dandy. Everything is running great until, you know, like 10 users try, try using her site at once and kind of predictably SQLite falls over because it's just not built for that, right? And Alice, she realizes she's, she's got to set up some sort of real database. And um, she, she, she knows that Postgres is a, is a real RDBMS, right? A real relational database management system that supports concurrent access and all this kind of stuff. And, Alice, she's, like I said, a huge Kubernetes user. And so she Googles, you know, hey, how do I set up Postgres in Kubernetes? And of course, there's lots of tutorials out there. And they all kind of boil down to what you see here on your screen, right? She creates a secret using kubectl and then uh, persistent volume claims. So she's got some persistent storage for the database and the deployment file and the service um, uh, manifest, right? And she goes and deploys Postgres and changes her application so that it is connecting to her Postgres cluster instead of SQLite. And this all works great. The only problem with that is now Alice, she is now in the DBA game, right? And that's not really what she had in mind. Uh, she wanted to focus on uh, writing her application and not necessarily administering databases. So what is she to do, right? She hears about AWS's RDS database service, right? Um, which provides a managed relational database experience. And um, she thinks, oh, that's great. You know, now I don't need to be the DBA. Uh, I'll just set up a, an RDS instance and Amazon will do all the heavy lifting around managing uh, the, the database instances. But she notices that there's a problem, right? So she goes to create this uh, RDS database instance and she logs into the AWS console and everything is just kind of like incongruent for Alice, right? She really, she really loves her cozy Kubernetes experience and having to like sort of like go into the web console and click through like a wizard to create database instances is just not really what she wanted. Um, 
I mean, she didn't have to use the AWS console, right? She could have also used the AWS CLI tool. She could have used something like CloudFormation or Terraform. You know, all of those things are, are perfectly good tools. But at the end of the day, those aren't Kubernetes. And Alice really likes Kubernetes. She wants to stick in her Kubernetes cozy universe and use the Kubernetes API uh, to manage all the resources in her application, including the dependencies of, of those um, applications like a database service. She loves Kubernetes, but not quite enough to be a DBA, <laughs> right? Uh, she wants to use RDS so that it takes away all that like management of database stuff away from her. She doesn't have to deal with the pain point of, of all that administrivia. What can she do? Well, that's pretty much what ACK is, right? Uh, it allows Alice to simply kube cuddle apply a Kubernetes manifest that describes an RDS database instance in this case, right? Uh, so instead of logging into the AWS web console or using CloudFormation or the AWS CLI or any of those non-Kubernetes tools, she just simply writes a Kubernetes manifest to, to the Kubernetes API and boom, an ACK service controller for RDS takes over the management of the life cycle of that particular resource. And that's pretty much what ACK is. Right? It, it kind of boils down to let's allow Kubernetes users to, to stay in the Kubernetes API, use the familiar um, Kubernetes manifest and uh, configuration language, but have uh, service uh, custom controllers for Kubernetes manage those resources in the AWS APIs. Um, so, you know, hopefully ACK was solving Alice's problems. Uh, let's take a look sort of under the covers and see if it can help solve some of yours too. So, um, like I mentioned, Kubernetes experience for AWS services. It's kind of providing a bridge, right? This sort of integration bridge between the AWS services, and I, I say AWS managed services here, but it's really any AWS service, regardless of whether it's a, a managed service like RDS or something like that, right? Um, so uh, there are custom controllers within the ACK project, one for each AWS service. So there's an S3 service controller for ACK, an SNS service controller for ACK, et cetera. And uh, like all custom controllers in the Kubernetes universe, Kubernetes stores the desired resource state, right? So when Alice writes a Kubernetes manifest for an RDS DB instance kind, through to the Kubernetes API. She does so using kubectl apply. Kubernetes API server stores what Alice had requested as the desired resource state for her DB instance. And then the ACK service controller, which is the Kubernetes custom controller for that particular service, handles the lifecycle of that managed service resource. So uh, in the case of the RDS, ACK service controller, it will call create DB instance in the RDS API and manage the lifecycle of the DB instance uh, for um, the Kubernetes user. One important thing that I like to bring up early on <laughs> is that there is no use of cloud formation in ACK. And the reason I bring this up is um, ACK, the AWS Controllers for Kubernetes project, is um, a sort of redesign or a rethink of a project called the AWS Service Operator, or ASO, uh, which uh, an ex-colleague of mine, Chris Hine, created uh, back in 2018. And ASO, the AWS Service Operator, was a fairly thin shim across CloudFormation. So when you, for instance, created an S3 bucket via the AWS service operator, what actually happened behind the scenes was that a CloudFormation stack was created and within that CloudFormation stack, an S3 bucket was created. And when we were thinking about how, to, how do we redesign the AWS service operator and sort of bring it into some, some of the more modern uh, Kubernetes client libraries and, and controller runtime and that kind of thing, uh, we were thinking, well, is that user experience really kind of surprising? You know, I mean, if, if someone creates an S3 bucket via a Kubernetes manifest and 
the service controller actually creates a CloudFormation stack behind the scenes that creates that S3 bucket. And then someone sort of logs into the AWS console or, or looks at CloudWatch or something and sees that a CloudFormation stack was created. Uh, is that a, we, we thought that was a surprising user experience. And so we decided not to use CloudFormation uh, within the design of ACK. And that's why I put it here as a, <laughs> just to, to warn people, you know, this is a, it, it's not just a thin layer on top of CloudFormation. As I mentioned, each AWS service has its own separate ACK service controller. Way back when, in the early sort of design of ACK, we thought about making a single binary, right? Um, which frankly is the way that the AWS service operator was structured, right? A single binary that could communicate with lots of different AWS services and manage the lifecycle of the resources in all of those APIs. Um, after discussing with a number of our more security conscious folks, we decided that it was a better idea to have separate service controller binaries for managing the resources in one particular AWS service. And the reason for that was so that we could um, promote and encourage a best practice of having a very finely scoped set of IAM role policies that only allowed the IAM role that the service controller was executing in uh, to manage the resources in one particular API. If we had a single binary, the IAM role and the policy associated with that IAM role that was running that single binary would essentially need to have like this sort of super user uh, sort of God level scope. And that's something that we didn't really uh, want to promote. And that's the reason why we chose to create a separate, separate service controller binaries, one for each service. So we could, you know, fine grain scope that, that IAM role. Um, what we would like to do, this is a little bit aspirational, uh, as I'll, I'll explain here in a second when I talk about our release process, but uh, you will install ACK service controllers using Helm or static manifest that we will distribute as artifacts for each of the releases. Uh, or we're actually putting together helper scripts, like since we do have lots of these separate ACK service controllers, one for each AWS service, and we do have lots and lots of AWS services. I mean, I think there's like what, 170 AWS service APIs at this point or more. Um, we, we knew that it, it's not a great user experience to actually ask people to you know, manually install either with Helm install or, or manually with like KubeCuddle or Customize or something. Uh, over a hundred different service controllers. And so we're writing some helper scripts that essentially automate this process of installing service controllers for a list of services so that you don't have to uh, you know, re repeat the installation process. Um, another important aspect of the ACK design is that everything, including the controller implementation itself is generated. So uh, many of you might be familiar with a project called KubeBuilder, right? KubeBuilder is, um, it's frankly an, an awesome project, but it generates the code for custom Kubernetes controllers and the API types. And it uses um, uh, a, a set of libraries called uh, controller tools, which has this controller gen binary in it that can generate the different CRDs and deep copy files and, and roles and all sorts of, you know, the, the sort of foundational stuff that you need in a Kubernetes custom controller. Um, what KubeBuilder does not do, however, is generate the controller implementation for you. So basically what it does is it outputs a, a stub of a, of a controller and then it's up to you to, to go ahead and write the Go code for implementing that particular controller. Well, uh, and that's all fine and dandy. Only we realized that with 170 plus AWS services, hand building a, an implementation of each service controller was just not really feasible. And so we set about to create a code generator that actually generates the full service controller implementation. And that includes the linkage with the AWS SDK Go 
which is you know, the library that we use to communicate with the backend AWS services. Uh, we have a, a sort of a small ACK runtime that provides this linkage you know, between like a reconciling controller and the various AWS SDK Go um, calls that we make. But at the end of the day, each service controller is fully code generated. And that's kind of what makes ACK different from um, uh, some other things, right? Another important thing to, uh, two important things to point out. Uh, we consult with the AWS service teams in question to make sure that what we are generating for their service controller actually, you know, is calling their API in a semantically and behaviorally correct way. So for instance, we're working hand in hand with the Elasticash team and the step functions and Lambda team to make sure that the ACK service controller for Elasticash and step functions and Lambda and SageMaker and these other services actually behaves the way that they, you know, uh, expect it to behave. It's making calls in the way that it should be. And then finally, there is absolutely nothing that is specific to EKS. So um, ACK service controllers can be installed on any target Kubernetes cluster whatsoever, uh, it, regardless of whether you choose to use the, the managed control plane uh, flavor of, of EKS. Let's talk a little bit more about the code generation. I mentioned that we generate the entire controller implementation, and that is true. Uh, we actually have this multi-phase approach to code generation. And we use as the source of truth, the AWS SDK Go model or API models that are actually included in the AWS SDK Go source repository. We use these models, which are JSON files that describe each of the API operations and these things called shapes, right? Uh, which are essentially described the, the payloads um, and resources of that, that top level API. Anyway, we use these model files, we consume them, and then we generate the Kubernetes API files, right? The, the Go files that represent the custom resource definitions. We, for each of the top level resources in the API that we identify. And then once we do that, we move on to this sort of second phase of generating this, the, the deep copy code, the, the object code for uh, the Kubernetes API machinery. And we generate some CRD configuration files, the, 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 the YAML manifest that describe the particular custom resource definition. And then we generate the entire controller for the service. So we generate the, the RBOC uh, configuration stuff as well. So it's this sort of like multi-phase waterfall of, <laughs> of code generation that happens for each of the services. Let's talk a little bit about access control, authorization, auth Auth Z. Um, I put a, a link here, which you know, if you go and download this, the, the files or you can just follow this link, uh, it has a, a diagram uh, on that page. And that diagram is uh, primarily there to focus your attention on the fact that there are two different RBOC systems, role-based access control systems in place with ACK at any given time and that they don't overlap with each other. And it's, it's very important to, to understand how these different RBOC systems are used, right? So Alice, the Kubernetes user that, that calls kubectl apply and passes in like uh, RDS uh, db instance .yaml file, right? Alice is a Kubernetes user who is associated with a role, a Kubernetes role, and that Kubernetes role is, has a role binding, which allows Alice to read or write um, custom resources of a particular kind. In, in Alice's case, it would be um, rds.services.kates.aws forward slash db instance. Like that, that would be the kind that she has permission to uh, create. That is the Kubernetes role-based access control system in, in play, right? That once the Kubernetes API receives a request from Alice and determines the role that she is operating under, um, it then performs its authorization and access control to determine whether or not Alice, the Kubernetes user, has the ability to uh, write a 
custom resource of that kind to the server. However, once that's done and uh, the Kubernetes API server writes the custom resource representing the RDS database instance to etcd behind the scenes, it returns success to Alice. Um, that is the end of the Kubernetes RBOC scope. Um, at that point, the ACK service controller for RDS, it has picked up in its reconciliation loop that there's a new custom resource of kind, you know, RDS DB instance. And then at that point, it's going to need to call the AWS RDS API, right, to manage the lifecycle of DB instances in um, a particular AWS account. And that RBOC system, the IAM role based RBOC system, is in place for the serv or it's in place for the IAM role associated with the service account that the ACK service controller runs as. And there is no overlap whatsoever between the Kubernetes RBOC that Alice you know, is, is uh, controlled by and the IAM role that the ACK service controller is using in order to determine whether it has the rights to manage the lifecycle in the RDS API. It's very important to understand like the scope of where those two different RBOC systems come into play. We are recommending, um, for, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, we have something called pod IRSA or pod IAM roles for service accounts. It is our recommended way of providing fine grained IAM permissions for a specific pod. And this is in uh, contrast to the, uh, the default um, uh, setup where the IAM role associated with the worker node that the Kubelet is running on, uh, those permissions are used uh, by default for pods. So with pod IRSA, you should be able to associate an IAM role to the service account that a specific pod is running at. And that IAM role is used in the ACK service controller to determine the, the policy, the IAM policy that it has in order to make the calls to the AWS RDS API. All right, so one last thing around authorization and access control, something I'm super excited about. So one of the contributors to the ACK project named Amin Hilali, he has been working on this project called Cross Account Resource Management or CARM. And when we realized that, okay, we're gonna be having lots of these different ACK service controllers, we, we didn't want to have a user experience where in order to control resources across multiple AWS accounts, that the user would have to install an ACK service controller in lots of different Kubernetes clusters, each associated with a separate AWS account. Uh, we just like just did not want that user experience of having to install hundreds of these service controllers. So instead, what the cross account resource management project allows is for a cluster admin to associate an AWS account ID to a Kubernetes namespace via an annotation. And when a user creates a custom resource in that Kubernetes namespace, the ACK service controller can say, oh, hey, look, there is an annotation. I think it's uh, services.kates.aws forward slash owner dash account dash ID. And it sees that annotation exists for the namespace. And as soon as it sees that, it says, okay, I, I'm going to need to call STS assume role to pivot the AWS client that's inside the ACK service controller so that it can uh, make uh, API calls against the AWS API as a, um, a, as a separate AWS owner account. And in this way, a single ACK service controller can manage the lifecycle of resources across lots of different AWS accounts. So if you're in uh, an organization that has lots of different, that manages lots of different AWS accounts. Uh, this frankly should be like top of your mind as far as the, the features that are coming soon to uh, ACK because it'll make your life a whole lot easier. Another thing, what about secret stuff? Any of you who are familiar with the RDS create DB instance API call know that it has 
a little bit of an issue. You send the master user password in plain text in the create, the create DB instance API call. Clearly, that's not a Kubernetes best practice. And uh, obviously, the Kubernetes best practice is to store secret stuff in secrets and then reference that secret uh, where you need to in your, in your resources, in your custom resource. So what the secret reference project does is uh, implement basically that. It replaces the master user password's data type underneath in, in the custom resource definition from string to a secret reference, right? Um, actually, it's a key reference within a secret. And this allows um, a cluster admin to set up a secret called DB secrets with a key within that secret called master user password. And they can control the, the access and, and RBUC and all that kind of stuff on the secret themselves. And then all Alice needs to do is reference that by name. Uh, she doesn't need to uh, do anything other than that. Some other things that I'm excited about coming soon. And when I say soon, I mean within the next few months. <laughs> okay, so standardized AWS tag representation for all ACK resources. Um, and then the, the second bullet point, uh, tags that all uh, custom resources within a namespace should have, kind of related. So the first one refers to the fact that they're across the, the universe of AWS service APIs, the way that tags are represented, meaning the data type <laughs> that a tag takes, is very inconsistent. And um, so, you know, some, some of the APIs, they allow uh, tagging a resource on the create call, like basically setting a, a set of tags. Some uh, don't allow that. Uh, some of the service APIs represent it as a map of string to string. Other APIs represent it as a list of structs with a key and a value. Uh, and then there's, <laughs> there's other representations as well. This first bullet point is about having ACK standardize that representation so that any custom resource that ACK manages, you, you, you specify the tags in spec.tags and it is a map of string to string, that's it. No uh, inconsistent um, representation of the tag data structure. The second bullet point is allowing um, a specific set of AWS tags that all custom resources within a namespace should always have. So if uh, the cluster admin wants to make sure that any RDS instance that is created within namespace foo should be tagged with, you know, should have an AWS tag of bar, then they would annotate the namespace with that set of tags that should always be uh, placed on um, uh, DB instance custom resources. Finally, uh, common rate limiting and throttling support. So I was actually talking with uh, Jason DeTiberis and the cluster API folks about uh, how can we have a common rate limiting and throttling support library for AWS APIs in ACK that can be then referenced from cluster API and um, uh, projects like Crossplane um, so that we don't have to like sort of constantly uh, repeat ourselves and all of us sort of like work on uh, various uh, variations of the same theme. Uh, so this is a, this common rate limiting and throttling support for AWS API calls is something that uh, I'm really uh, excited to get done in the next few months. And then finally, there is uh, this idea that look, um, you've created an S3 bucket or an RDS database instance or an SNS topic or SQSQ or whatever in the AWS console completely outside uh, of um, ACK's knowledge. And you, don't, you want to essentially have ACK start managing that resource. Well, in uh, this resource adoption uh, GitHub issue and project, uh, we are allowing that. So you will annotate the custom resource with uh, an ARN, an AWS resource name, and that is an indication to the ACK service controller that it should expect that the resource with this particular ARN already exists. And um, it should just essentially place that resource under its own management, as opposed to attempting to recreate um, a, a resource with that name. Okay. All right, uh, this, this final set of things. I just want to discuss sort of how we're handling the release cycle or the release cadence for ACK. As I've, I've mentioned a few times now, there are 
well over 150 AWS service APIs. We want to get to all of them, right? We want to support all of them in ACK, but it's just, it's not feasible to do that all in one go. So the way that we are thinking about it is we'll have, we have these phases where um, a group of services will get their controllers generated and then um, included in the ACK source repository and get uh, binary Docker images created and Helm charts created and pushed up. Um, to uh, a, a Docker re registry and Helm repository. Um, these phases of services are documented on the AWS controllers for Kubernetes GitHub page. We have a project um, that shows the sort of release ma map for these phases of controllers. We're going initially into what we're calling developer preview. And that essentially just means um, the Helm chart is not, is not currently available uh, for easy installation. And the way that you work with these service controllers is frankly not particularly user-friendly. It's, it's very sort of like developer-y. You use uh, test credentials and anyway, the, uh, long story short, it's not particularly user-friendly in developer preview. Uh, when we get uh, a set of bugs for these phases of, of service controllers, and we get those bugs fixed and we're happy with the stability of the service controllers, then we'll move them into a beta phase. And then we're aiming to get these phases of controllers into GA within three months of placing them into developer preview. The services that we initially placed into developer preview are listed here, S3, SNS, SQS, ECR, DynamoDB, and API Gateway V2. Of those, unfortunately, SQS had a bit of an issue and it's not yet in the uh, the ACK uh, source repository. Um, DynamoDB should be by the end of the week as well as API Gateway V2. We're just waiting on a couple end-to-end -end tests. The next phase of um, uh, ACK service controllers is RDS, Elasticache. We've got some parts of CloudFront, some parts of EC2 and EKS. And those should be coming out, you know, the next few weeks, next couple of weeks. And then, um, sorry, after that, we're, we're looking at um, uh, the Kafka service. We're looking at Lambda, step functions, uh, and more. So the project that you see here uh, linked, you can go there and see the release roadmap of what we have planned, what is currently targeting for developer preview and currently like a uh, work in progress, and then uh, beta and GA after that. And I'll just wrap up by saying everything about ACK is open source and uh, we are absolutely uh, jazz to get feedback from everybody and uh, contributions if you feel like it. Um, and uh, these two links uh, should get you started going in the right direction. So with that, I will wrap up the presentation and I'm looking forward to answering some questions that folks have. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. We have a few questions here. How different is this from EKS? Uh, all right, so Najib, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, so, uh, ACK is entirely different from EKS. EKS is a service, an AWS service that installs a managed control plane and recently a, a more managed data plane with managed node groups, but a managed control plane for Kubernetes. So um, ACK is a set of Kubernetes native applications, Kubernetes custom controllers that allow a Kubernetes native way of managing resources outside uh, uh, in the AWS APIs. Okay. Can you elaborate on the level effort, level of effort needed to run ACK on any Kubernetes distro? Um, that's a, that's a very good question. <laughs> uh, right now in developer preview, uh, unless you are pretty comfortable using, uh, things like customize and, uh, you know, manually deploying, uh, pods and deployments using kubectl, uh, I would 
maybe wait a little while, uh, maybe a month or two <laughs> until we get the initial phase of controllers into beta, which then we will have Helm charts for those controllers, which will make, frankly, the, the installation and management of ACK service controllers um, uh, much easier. How are cross-resource references implemented? Tomash, so uh, I think it depends on the resource. If, if it is within a specific, okay. Um, so if it's within a particular API, for instance, um, within RDS, the, if you look at the API call that references another resource object within that API, we may be replacing um, the custom resource definition field from, let's say, an ARN to instead be an object reference that refers to a different custom resource within the RDS um, uh, set of custom resource definitions. Now, if the if the cross <laughs> if the cross resource reference is across APIs. For instance, if it's API gateway to uh, EC2 VPC or um, Elasticash to uh, EC2 security groups, things like that, uh, we will likely uh, continue to refer to those things via ARN uh, and not have an object reference type. Uh, I, I, Tomas, I hope that uh, answers your question. Please, um, please let me know if it if it didn't, I think that's what you were asking. But. Okay, uh, so Ryan's asking, what kinds of tags does ACK apply to create an AWS resource? Is there a way to guard against accidental kubectl delete, even if it is just, uh, <laughs> I really don't, don't wanna delete this flag, very nice. Um, we haven't decided this yet. There is an issue, uh, if you go to the, to the web, site, uh, the GitHub site um, that's on your screen now, and go to the issues list, there, is, there are two issues. You should search for something called, um, uh, oh, gosh, I'm trying to remember, um, destructive operations, um, or what I think it, it's either delete operations or destructive operations or destructive behavior. There is an issue that talks about um, basically how, how do we prevent deletion of important resources? I, I think what'll end up happening is that we will have some annotations on Kubernetes namespace that will allow the ACK service controller to be configured in a certain way for CRs in that particular Kubernetes namespace to essentially allow some sort of like deletion propagation or deletion policy or pr protection, that kind of thing. Um, it's likely going to be fairly dependent on the AWS API behind it. Um, and it's likely going to be up to a cluster admin to, to, to configure a specific CRD or a specific custom resource type or kind um, to behave in certain ways. Because we've, we've frankly run the gamut as far as uh, feedback that we've gotten from people. Some folks want ACK just to, just to take over management of the resource and just do the, do the necessary. And others are a lot more skeptical about it and um, would like to have sort of like deletion protection on, on objects. And uh, the other issue that, um, that is related to tags, there are two, there's uh, an issue that is around the standardization of AWS tags and the representation of those tags for custom resources that ACK manages. And there was also an issue about uh, what AWS tags should be auto created on any custom resource that that ACK service controller is managing. Uh, so there's, there's two resources there. Ryan, I definitely encourage you to check out um, or sorry, there's two issues there. Ryan, I, I definitely uh, uh, encourage you to uh, comment and, uh, you know, plus one or whatever, the, um, uh, each of those issues. So this, all right, uh, let's see. Najib is asking, will I still be charged for invoking APIs through ACK, like one paying for invoking nat native AWS? Yes, absolutely. So um, 
look, uh, ACK doesn't remove the, the charges for resources that it creates. Um, the charges are exactly the same. So uh, regardless of whether ACK is the thing that uh, ends up calling create DB instance for the RDS API, uh, the, the charges that you will accumulate uh, are exactly the same, right? Uh, so very similar to, um, to CloudFormation, right? So there was announcements for something, uh, so Anonymous is asking, there was an announcement for something similar in 2018. Was it admission controllers? Um, not entirely sure about that. Sorry, Anonymous. Uh, you may be thinking about the AWS service operator, which is the um, sort of one of the things that uh, originated the idea for uh, AWS controllers for Kubernetes. Yeah. Uh, you got it. It's uh, AW, the service operator for Kubernetes, right? Uh, this is sort of the, the next generation of that, the reincarnation of that. Okay. Um, if anyone would like to ask any more questions, please go right ahead and do so. We only have about 15 minutes left. Oh, will ACK provide deeper visibility into the AWS services? Uh, I don't know whether, uh, I don't think it will provide deeper visibility. I think that it will provide a different type of visibility, Najib. So um, for those users, uh, those AWS customers or AWS users that um, prefer the Kubernetes environment, prefer the Kubernetes API and tooling and um, you know, the kubectl experience, the way that they will have visibility into AWS resources will be different, right? They'll be able to make a call to kubectl get DB instances and see a list of their, uh, their RDS database instances, as opposed to uh, calling the AWS CLI tool or logging into the AWS web console. Um, if, you're, if you're referring to, um, you know, the things like CloudTrail or CloudWatch logs or that kind of thing, there, there's nothing about ACK that's going to change the setup and the uh, auditability or traceability of, uh, of a particular AWS um, service. Um, what I would like to do, and one of, the, one of the things I was actually talking to a new contributor about this morning, uh, we need to get our Prometheus metric story uh, started. <laughs> and um, uh, one, of, one of the things that we would like to do is have Prometheus metrics uh, that are dimensioned based on the AWS API call that ACK service controllers are making so that you can see specifically how many and of what kind the, uh, uh, the AWS client is, is calling a specific AWS API. So you'll be able to say, you know, like, okay, how many times is, you know, I don't know, code deploy, get deployments being called per hour or something, right? Uh, we want to provide those types of metrics via a standardized set of Prometheus metrics that are dimensioned by uh, what is called the operation identifier within the AWS API. Okay. So is there any way of enabling cross-account resource management? Uh, yes, there will be. Uh, oh, hi, Harris. Uh, so uh, yes, there will be. Um, we're, we're probably a couple weeks out from the cross-account resource management being fully enabled. I merged the, the code, the, the largest part of the code, which uh, in incorporates some caching mechanisms for namespaces and, um, and config maps. Uh, earlier last week, we still need a little bit of work there. Uh, you will be able to quote, enable the cross account resource management by setting an annotation on a namespace. Um, so uh, look for that in the next uh, two to three weeks. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, Najib, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not entirely, uh, following what you mean by native visibility of Kubernetes. Perhaps you can elaborate a bit there. Okay, uh, Fahad is asking, how do, how do import existing resources in AWS into Kubernetes manifest under ACK management? Uh, for example, if I don't want to delete my existing RDS or S3 bucket. Yeah, so this was the adopt a resource functionality that I referred to uh, 
in uh, a, a couple of slides ago. And uh, the way that you will signal to, AC, to the ACK service controller that you want it to start managing the life cycle of a particular resource is you will um, create the Kubernetes manifest and within the annotations for that custom resource, you will have the owner account, I'm sorry, the um, uh, ARN, um, the services.cates.aws forward slash ARN. And that will indicate that the ACK service controller should expect that that resource already exists and not try to, to uh, create it again. Uh, hi, Harish. <laughs> How are you? Harish is a, a member of the EKS team. So what do you think about leveraging ACK to do heavy lifting for AWS cloud provider behind the scenes for managing and provisioning AWS resources instead of the current uh, implementation of AWS cloud provider? Um, I've actually thought about that, Harish, and uh, I've had some conversations with uh, some of the cluster API folks. I've had um, uh, conversations with Crossplane uh, folks from, from Upbound about how do we adapt the ACK generate command line tool, which is the, the primary code generator inside of ACK, so that instead of spitting out, um, you know, uh, Kubernetes API types and a custom controller implementation for ACK service controllers, that in it instead it spits out basically all the, the generated code for uh, AWS cloud provider, or uh, in the case of Crossplane, the uh, cloud, I think it's cloud, cloud provider dash AWS uh, package, right? So um, I'm, I'm actually got some prototype code going locally where I've been playing around with this idea of making the, the ACK generate um, CLI tool a lot more extensible so that it can kind of spit out Go code that fulfills sort of non ACK core use cases. Uh, so yeah, I think in the future, it definitely will be um, uh, possible to, to at least have ACK service controllers provide a sort of lower level, lower layer of functionality that then could be built upon in things like uh, cluster API and, and crossplane. Okay, so uh, how is ACK different from crossplane? I'll just uh, knock this one out real quick. Uh, so they're actually very complementary technologies. Uh, ACK, it, its entire mission is to provide a Kubernetes native API for managing AWS resources. That's it. It's not trying to do anything more than that. Crossplane has a much broader mission, right? Crossplane uh, has a mission to support cross cloud, meaning, you know, like to, to GKE and EKS and AKS and all different cloud providers, right? And, uh, have some sort of standardization for uh, cluster creation, uh, Kubernetes cluster creation, as well as some of the managed service creation for each of those different cloud providers. Um, so it's got a much broader mission. I think, I well, I hope that ACK, at least the code generator inside of ACK, can in the future be um, a library or, or a, um, a sort of input to the cross-plane AWS provider, at least. Um, and let's see, Najib, will there be a performance penalty uh, for using ACK because of two hops now? One is ACK and then native ADA. Um, no, there, there, sh there is no performance penalty. Um, there, there actually isn't two hops. Uh, so the, the Kubernetes user is communicating with the Kubernetes API. Right, right, and the ACK service controller is communicating with the AWS API. So it's not like the Kubernetes uh, user is communicating with the AWS API. Instead, they're only talking to the Kubernetes API, and then the service controller for ACK is the thing that's communicating with the AWS API. Okay, five. Uh, oh, I think I already answered that. Um, Uh, so Prometheus, uh, when I said Prometheus earlier, I'm more referring to just the, the format, right, of the, the expected metrics endpoint. If anyone has anything else to, they would like to ask? We have about five minutes left. 
I'd also like to, to point out something that I, I didn't include here, unfortunately, but uh, I'm, I'm on the provider-AWS uh, channel in the Kubernetes Slack community. So please feel free to hit me up uh, with any questions that you might think of uh, after this webinar. Um, I'm on there and happy to answer questions. How is HA handled for ACK controllers? Uh, if a controller crashes in the middle of an RDS S3 creation API call? Good question, Fahad. <laughs> so the way that we've built the uh, service controllers uh, should not depend on um, the leader election within Kubernetes. Uh, I still need to, um, I still need to work on some test cases to ensure that multiple ACK service controllers, multiple pods running the same ACK service controller um, can have concurrently executing uh, reconciliation loops and not trample on each other. Uh, but there is, there's nothing that we're doing inside the ACK service controller, for instance, setting a latest uh, observed version or latest observed um, uh, you know, sort of state. We're not setting that um, in a, from the ACK service controllers. So we're, and the reason we're not doing that is because by having that latest observed version field within the status of a custom resource, you essentially force the architecture of the, of the controller to be uh, a, a single writer. And um, we did not want that, right? We want to be able to have multiple concurrent uh, service controllers for the same service be able to execute uh, in, in multiple pods and not have them trample over each other. And one of the ways to do that is to ensure that you're not writing bits of information into the status uh, struct, the status field of a custom resource that represents the view of only a single writer. And that's what latest observed version actually is. It's not the latest observed version for the resource. It's the latest observed version for that particular controller that is <laughs> observing the resource. And uh, by, by getting rid of that, uh, we hope to, to have a more concurrent approach. Hope that answers your question. Uh, will ACK provide Kubernetes secret integration? Yes, absolutely it will. Um, there is a slide, I'll kind of go up here. Oops. Uh, whoops, I stopped screen sharing <laughs> by accident. Uh, yeah, there, there is a, a, a set of slides that, that explain that. They, uh, the, there are some fields within uh, AWS backend API calls, for instance, create DB instance, where you're passing in a plain text uh, string. Uh, we will be replacing those types of fields with secret reference fields uh, or fields with a secret reference data type. And uh, that means that you'll be able to set up a Kubernetes secret ahead of time and then reference that, reference a key within that secret from your custom resource. Any planned integration with Parameter Store and Secret Manager uh, for alternative to Secrets Manager in Kubernetes? Um, not within ACK, but that, um, that actually I had a meeting with the AWS config team recently about um, a similar topic. Um, fi find me on the provider AWS channel on Slack and uh, um, we, we can chat about it there. Anyone else have any last minute questions at all? We have about another minute or so before we wrap it up. Uh, Fahai was asking earlier uh, in the chat, is there support for Lambda in ACK? Uh, is there any plans for serverless services support? Um, not currently, 
I'm aiming for mid to end November for both Lambda and step functions. Luckily, both those APIs are actually fairly reasonable and sensible and, uh, <laughs> and concrete uh, with very few exceptions to them um, and very few inconsistencies. So um, yeah, we're aiming for mid, mid to late November for both step functions and Lambda. And once again, uh, thank you very much, Jerry, and for, to the CNCF for inviting me out here. It's, it's a pleasure. It's our pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. That um, should just about wrap up our webinar for today. As I said before, today's recording and slides will be posted on the CNCF webinar page. We'd like to thank everybody once again for joining us today, and to you as well, Jay. Everyone take care, stay safe, and we will see you next time.